Okay, so uh, you have a lot of really good information uh, about the common and uncommon tests used for assessing diabetes health. So right. let's start with the glucose tolerance test because that's something that I think a lot of people with diabetes are aware of, but not necessarily very many people actually have it done. So in your book, you say that the glucose tolerance test is the most accurate and comprehensive test available for determining a predisposition for prediabetes or diabetes. So can you kind of give some insight into what this test is and, and why it's actually so useful? Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of fallen out of use, uh, conventionally speaking, especially in 1997, when the criteria for diagnosing diabetes dropped from a fasting blood sugar of 140 to 127, precisely because they were recognizing that the complications of diabetes were actually occurring before the diagnosis was made. Because, because the complications were created by blood sugars that were far lower than what would be required to diagnose the disease. So that's, that was a kind of crazy, you know, cart before the horse scenario. And so uh, what, uh, what the, a lot of the researchers and clinicians did at the time is they thought, well, now that we have a more uh, sensitive standard, we don't need to hassle the patient with doing a glucose tolerance test. The problem was that wasn't, that wasn't a good decision, in my opinion, because because even now, the most sensitive test for, for catching early prediabetes or diabetes, or as you suggested, a predisposition to it, is the glucose tolerance test. The most sensitive glucose measure for, for determining our sensitivity is the one-hour level. And even the standard, the current standard for the glucose tolerance test, omits the one hour. You get a fasting you get a two hour. So that's why on my lab forms for my patients, I specify we get the half hour and the one hour. And then I take it a step further to check the third and the fourth hour to see how resistant they are to insulin, how long that hyperglycemia, that high blood sugar remains after that 75 gram uh, sugar drink. Uh, and for many patients, whether that blood sugar drops off into hypoglycemia. Uh, a third of my patients are actually hypoglycemic. They have adrenal fatigue scenarios. And, and so that test becomes one of the most fundamental tests to look at a three-dimensional view of our metabolism. What's happening, how quickly does the blood sugar spike? How long does it remain elevated? Does the blood sugar then cause a big slump or a drop off to hypoglycemia? And then what, what I do is I measure the fasting one hour and two hour insulin production by our own pancreas. And, and that actually is the most sensitive test for figuring out predisposition to not only diabetes or prediabetes, but also Alzheimer's risk, cardiovascular risk, uh, autoimmune risk. It's a, it's a wonderful test to assess because I have a lot of patients that have perfect fasting blood sugars, perfect after meal blood sugars, but their insulin levels are 10 times too high. And so that becomes the, the canary in the mind, so to speak, to catch things early. So, so that's why I like to do the, the glucose tolerance test. So in the glucose tolerance test, an uh, individual comes to your clinic and then they drink a 75 gram solution Contain, sorry, a solution containing 75 grams of sugar. Is that right? White table sugar? That's right. Well, it's actually glucose. It's pure glucose. Uh, and some people who, for whatever reason, don't want to do that, which is the current standard, uh, I, I give them the option to eat real food uh, or to eat whatever they're used to eating to see what the impact would be uh, comparable to, you know, every day of their lives. The other thing to note here is that, is that, uh, typically, if you look at the American Diabetes Association website and other similar websites, they'll say that there's 26 million Americans currently with type 2 diabetes. Um, but if you add a glucose tolerance test to that mix, in other words, you add a two hour after glucola or glucose load blood sugar, that number is increased by 14 million. It's actually over 40 million people who have type 2 diabetes in the United States alone. And so you can, you can see why there's so many people around that have just recently been tested by their doctor. They, they've gotten a fasting glucose in the metabolic profile. 
They may have even gotten a hemoglobin A1C, which is becoming more and more common as a screening tool, but both of those tests are woefully inadequate compared to a two-hour blood sugar. Okay, and, and, and so they're told, hey, you're, you're good. You're not pre-diabetic. You're certainly not diabetic, when in fact, they could actually have diabetes. Okay, so if an individual doesn't have you as their doctor, they're, let's say they're living in the middle of the country, and uh, they say to their doctor, hey, I'd like to get a glucose tolerance test, and if their doctor does say, okay, this is something that's useful, they don't get that one-hour measurement. They might get a fasting and a two-hour and a four-hour, right. and maybe they don't even get the insulin measurement. So right. uh, is there any other way, rather than working specifically with you, where people can get this information and find out what both their fasting, I'm sorry, their, their glucose and their insulin levels really are? Well, uh, there's more and more information on this on the internet. Well, one way is that I have patients will frequently give my book to their doctor and they say, hey, if you're really interested in my health, check out this information on the lab section and would you be willing to work with me and order some of these tests? So that's one option. Another option, I, you know, I, half of my patients I do by Skype or FaceTime all over the country or even internationally. So if people are not able to find any help, they can actually work directly with me or somebody like me that provides that online service. That's terrific. And so that's great to hear you say that you let people do real food on the test. So theoretically, somebody could just for fun do it at home. They could eat, you know, maybe enough bananas or something to add up to 75 grams of carbs and they could test their blood glucose. That's right. In fact, so there's a standardized method, which is the, you know, the, the pure glucose. So that would be com uh, comparable to a small soda. Uh, no, that's not true. A medium soda at a, at a theater, for instance. Um, or uh, once, once we understand their sensitivity to junk food, right, okay, then we can, uh, we can opt for a whole food tolerance test to see how well they handle just straight 75 grams of, of, uh, of for instance, fruit, fruit juice. Got it. Okay. And while we're talking about measuring insulin levels, um, I heard in one of your lectures online, you talk a lot about how much insulin levels are uh, an indicator of lots of diseases. So there's a strong connection between, like you said, breast cancer. Like, how important is it to really make sure you're on top of your insulin levels? Uh, I first heard about the connection uh, between insulin levels and breast cancer from Dr. Nancy Bohannon. And, and one of my colleagues was a, 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 a aging expert, a family physician who was a gerontologist. And, and she told me, she says, Wes, you know, the higher the fasting insulin levels, the higher the risk of breast cancer. And I go like, what would that have to do with breast cancer? So like, like any good clinician and researcher, uh, I went to the research and I started, and this was all the way back in 1990, and I actually found 700 separate studies showing the association between elevated fasting insulin levels and breast cancer. And finally, I said, okay, I get it. I don't need any more studies. There's a huge relationship here. And as you pointed out, the relationship is with most common cancers. In fact, we've known for over 45 years in the scientific literature that when your insulin levels are higher, okay, either, either because you're producing a lot of insulin to compensate for your internal resistance to insulin at the muscle and liver level, or you are basically using extra insulin injections to compensate for a bad lifestyle, right? If you just say, well, I just, I'll just eat whatever I want. I'll just take more insulin, okay? And, and that's, by the way, one way that a type 1 diabetic can actually also become a type 2 because they are now on top of the type 1 diabetes, they have all the manifestations of a type 2 diabetic, and now they add together, and that dramatically increases the risk of complications. Okay, and before we move on to the next topic, I want to keep on going on this insulin one, because this is a big deal. So, um, so you, this, we didn't say exactly the diet that you advocate. So you're telling people that they can get to a low level of insulin, an appropriate level of insulin, right. eating foods that potatoes, rice, some fruit, beans, legumes, stuff like that. And, and that's your experience. Just want to make sure that's clear. Absolutely. When somebody, see, the, 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 unfortunately, the big focus in, in medical care up to date has been on just controlling blood sugars any way you can. 
And so they'll use oral medications or extra insulin for the type 2 diabetic to just get a better blood sugar level or better A1C. Problem is, the recent studies done out of Mayo Clinic are showing that the more you do that, the higher the risk of microvascular complications and macrovascular complications, your risk of heart attacks and stroke. It all goes up when you try to just control it with more medication. So the answer is go whole food. The number one strategy to improve our health is, is not just trying to lower the blood sugar through any means possible, but to start eating 100% plant-based foods, and all of a sudden your body responds to that and begins healing. You're getting to that tipping point where the body can actually heal and improve. So you yourself are vegan, is that correct? That's right. And how long have you been a vegan for? Well, I grew up vegetarian. My, my parents were vegetarians, and, uh, uh, but then when I was 24 years old, I was in my professional training program, and um, one of my classmates was a med tech as well. And so she said, Wes, why don't you come get your lipid profile done? So I said, sure, man, I'm, I'm Mr. Health. You know, I'm sure it's like 140, 150 at the most, right? Because I knew what the ranges should be. And this is 1984 when the cholesterol education program first came out. Uh, prior to that, cholesterol up to 320 was, was uh, considered normal, right? And so, uh, so I had my cholesterol checked, and uh, two days later, she came back with a piece of paper looking kind of worried, and I thought she was just busting my chops, like messing with me. And she said, she said, Wes, your cholesterol's kind of high. I go, come on, Lori. And then I looked at the paper, and and I was shocked. My cholesterol was 244. So being vegetarian, meaning, you know, uh, enjoying the cheeses and the dairy products and, and the, the desserts associated with that and the eggs, et cetera, clearly wasn't working for me, right? And so, so I did a, a six-week research project on myself, and I could modulate my cholesterol 90 points either way by just going – uh, between a healthy vegetarian diet and a healthy vegan diet. Wow, that's fantastic. So now when you get your fasting lipid panel, what, what are the... Yeah, so I, I, I keep mine, you know, consistently under 180. That's my goal. That's great. Okay, so, so we talked about the glucose tolerance test and why it's such an important test in determining not only your risk for diabetes, but also your risk for cancer and all the other complications that come along with diabetes. When it comes to the C-peptide test, that's another very valuable test for really understanding what your total insulin production is. So can you go into a little detail about what is the C-peptide test and why is it so important? Okay, well, most doctors will use a C-peptide test to verify with a patient, is this patient a type 2 diabetic that's using a lot of insulin, kind of brittle, or is it really a, or is, are they really a type 1 diabetic? So really, type 1 diabetes is, is denoted primarily by the inability of the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas, to produce insulin, you know, any measurable amount of insulin. And so the, the problem with measuring insulin to determine the body's ability to make insulin is that the type 1 diabetics are using insulin and injecting it. And so you don't know whether you're measuring the injectable insulin or the amount that the body's making. So a C-peptide test is, is a way to, to measure the insulin produc uh, producing capacity of the pancreas without being complicated with the insulin measurement. So, so anytime I have a question about that, I will, I will measure the C-peptide fasting, and, and there are standards on the lab that tell us whether or not that puts them into a type 1 diabetes or a type 2 diabetes scenario. Now, the way I like to use the C-peptide for the average diabetic, type 2 diabetic, is actually I do a one-hour stimulated C-peptide where they, they eat, they eat uh, 75 grams of carbs uh, to increase the blood sugars, and then we check the C-peptide level one hour later and so presumably, if your blood sugar goes up, your pancreas should be stimulated to produce more C-peptide and insulin. And, and if that level is, is less than two, that means that there's, there's an estimated only 5% chance that that person would be able to regain dramatic function of the pancreas, at least in a three to six month time span, uh, and, and therefore, 
you know, we are able to counsel them of what to expect on the program. You know, they're, we're preventing complications, we're doing all the important things, but they may still need some insulin in the future. But, but if they're between two and four, it's a 50-50. If they're above four, it's a 95% chance that they could reverse this and not need any medications whatsoever within a three-month period. And guess what? Almost everybody I test is above four, even though their blood sugars may be running three and 400. They're still above four, which means that their pancreas has not reached that point uh, of, of serious failure. They're in a fatigue mode. They're, they're burning out their pancreas, their ability to make insulin, but they still have the capacity to produce enough insulin to control blood sugars naturally. 